basic uh, emergency or basic food pre preparation. Um, I brought in a bunch of stuff over there on the table, uh, different various forms of uh, food. We've got freeze-dried food mostly. Uh, I also have some uh, magazines of a magazine I subscribe to called uh, Backwoods Home, which is a homesteading magazine. A lot of great information in some of those magazines. And a couple of homesteading books and various other stuff too in, in there also. Uh, I didn't bring any canning goods in yet, but um, uh, I don't have those. I'm still working on trying to get that going. But uh, basic uh, emergency preparedness. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said that too, as well, and, uh, and he said a lot of wise things. Okay. Unforeseen events and preparedness. Uh, some of the things that uh, we prepare for are uh, economic collapse. Um, you know, our economy is uh, not really doing all that great right now. And um, uh, and if you look at uh, some of the other economies around the world, especially like Venezuela, they're really hurting down there. And, um, you know, their food is very expensive. Their money is in hyperinflation. They have to carry wheelbarrows of cash around just to be able to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, <clears throat> grid down or power loss. Um, if you're uh, without power for an extended period of time. Uh, as I recall, there's been two incidents uh, in St. Louis within the past few years in which one was in the summer and one was in the winter where power was out for an extended period of time. I think in the winter, it was, uh, there was a lot of people that were down uh, for about a two week period, right in the middle of winter during an ice storm. And uh, there was also an incident that occurred uh, where some storms rolled through the area and there were uh, hundreds of thousands without power during the middle of the summer when it was uh, real nice and hot, right in the middle of July. And uh, fortunately I, I had some friends and family members who were who were down and without power. And uh, they, uh, they actually relied on me to kind of help them out because they weren't necessarily prepared to be able to handle that situation. Uh, government takeover. Um, the risk of that happening is, well, you know, it, you never know, uh, given the current conditions. Um, martial law. Um, well, with the events of uh, Ferguson and uh, some of the other areas around the nation where they've had some rioting and so forth, you could see some uh, uh, possible events of that happening. Uh, Somehow I've got. Okay, um, this this uh, slide here. Um, currently, our government is um, uh, Obama has signed Executive Order One Three Six Zero Three, the National Defense Resources Preparedness. Uh, allows the president to have absolute control over four f food resources for all commodities and products that are capable of being ingested by humans and animals. And this has been in existence since uh, uh, 2012. Uh, at the time, the president's choosing of the federal government may take over all forms of energy, all forms of transportation, all usable water from all possible sources, all commodities and products that are capable of um, being as food and health resources, which includes drugs, biological products, medical devices, materials, facilities, health supplies, and services. So the president has the power to um, commandeer all of these things, which means for us, we have to be able to have access to those things and the only way you do that is by uh, preparing and, and stocking up on some of those. Food prices also have a um, effect on um, our uh, food preps too and uh, our food access. Uh, over the course of um, 2010, as you can see here, um, the black line is uh, your standard inflation and then you see all these other lines here of um, the food prices. Food has gotten very expensive, and uh, I don't think anybody here uh, 
you know, doesn't realize that. All you have to do is go grocery shopping a couple of times. And, you know, I know the amount that I used to spend for grocery shopping, uh, I would say 10 years ago, was way less than what I'm spending now. Uh, and in an emergency, everything can be gone in only a few hours. So if you wait until the emergency happens and then go, oh, I'm going to go to the store and hurry up and stock up on milk and bread and eggs, uh, chances are there won't be anything left. Um, uh, there's been, uh, you know, hurricanes and so forth down south. There's been um, uh, massive uh, snowstorms in the northeast. And every time one of those instances occur, um, you tend to get the uh, grocery store stripped of everything very, very quickly. Uh, two of the things that you want to start storing are water and food. Water can be stored in uh, varying um, methods. Um, you have a method there where you have uh, the, the large barrels. Uh, it's recommended that you store one gallon per day per adult in your home. And uh, obviously, you know, for an extended period of time, you're going to have to store a lot of water. Um, and then you also have to remember and take into account that you're going to need additional water for sanitation and for pets. And sanitation is very important because you can't keep things clean, then you introduce uh, some disease. Storage containers are the difference between life and death. Don't take the easy option, invest in quality containers. What you want to do is you want to invest in containers that are BPA free, uh, that uh, do not promote uh, bacteria growth inside of them. A lot of the uh, blue ones uh, do that. You also may want to introduce some um, uh, chlorine into some of the water too to help uh, preserve it as well. How do water bottles hold up over time? Has what? How does water bottles hold up over Regular water bottles actually dissolve. The clear water bottles that like are shown in the upper left-hand corner up there, what happens to those is, is over time, they start to, uh, the water starts absorbing the chemicals that are in the plastic. And not only that, but because of it is clear, um, if light were to shine on that on an extended period of time, it would, you would actually get some bacteria growth in there and that water would be no longer good for you. So clear water bottles are really not the way to go. It might be a short-term storage where you rotate it out a lot, but uh, you want something that's going to keep the sunlight out. Uh, the shelf life, uh, it's recommended you have the means to store and or treat enough water for a minimum of one year. Uh, it's highly suggested to rotate uh, your water every six to nine months. So even if you do have those barrels up there, you want to rotate that water out. You don't want to leave it get in there getting stale. You know, you know water is not something that you can store for years on end like you can freeze dry food. <coughs> uh, it's highly suggested to um, seal long term storage are generally rotated every five years. So those are the long term storage barrels that are that can handle that. Bottled water should be rotated every six months to avoid chemicals from the plastic mixing with the uh, purified water. And that's where they break down. They, it does break down over time. Uh, you want to protect the water from the sunlight, UV rays, stored in dark, uh, cool locations or containers with UV protection to avoid <coughs> spores or algae. Um, the bathtub there filled with water would be just an emergency situation that would be a short term solution. You obviously would not want to leave that water sitting in there for years on end or uh, months on end or days on end for that matter. Uh, purification. Unpurified water can be the difference between life and death. There are several methods for water purification and you'll need to figure out what works best for your situation. You can use uh, bleach, iodine, uh, boiling, filtration systems, and various other methods. Um, there are some uh, gravity-fed water filtration systems that are very popular. I think they're like the ceramic uh, uh, globe-type ones. They're filled with uh, carbon and so forth that filters out all the uh, 
chemicals or not not chemicals, but uh, algae and bacteria and things of that nature, the things that can make you sick. Um, there are other systems such as Berkeley um, that are expensive, but they can also provide you with up to six months of uh, drinking water. Um, some instances for using uh, some chlorine and uh, iodine on um, pur purifying your water. You want to use like for example, for a quart, you want to use a couple of drops um, of bleach. Um, and if you use bleach, you want to make sure that you get the bleach bleach. You don't want to get bleach mixed with fragrances or things of that nature because that would tend to really change the taste of your water if you store it. Um, and then there's obviously wait times for uh, the purification when you're uh, <coughs> when you're doing them. You want to, you know, clear water. You want to want to keep the water temperature uh, at a prime condition. You want to make sure that, um, you know, if your water's cloudy, you, you know, you're going to want to wait an hour for uh, some of those uh, purification steps. And food storage. Food storage is kind of, kind of tricky. There's so many methods to food storage. Where should you begin? Uh, how much food should I have on hand? How do I store food for the long term? And, you know, I don't necessarily have the money to buy some of the expensive freeze-dried food. <clears throat> or I don't know how to grow a garden. Or I don't have a method of cooking without electricity. Um, all of these are, are questions that you need to ask yourself and, and mow over when you're uh, preparing you know, food storage or starting food storage. Uh, so where do I begin? Determine what you and your family eat on a weekly and monthly basis. Put it down on paper. You know, see what your uh, family favorites are and what some of those items that are non-perishable are. Uh, another step is run a cost sheet to see, who, to see what the non-perishable items cost and how much of your funds you can use to allocate to uh, food storage. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, buying that extra couple of cans of food and stashing it away. Um, it's simple, simple as that. Uh, that's a good start. Um, purchasing the extra items every week, um, you know, and um, finding a place in the house and storing them. And then you repeat those processes until you feel comfortable that you have enough food for your family in a time of crisis. Um, you know, food and food storage does take up a lot of space. Um, it is recommended that you have a year supply of food per person per household. Uh, obviously, that is a lot of food, so you have to, you know, you have to be able to uh, have sufficient storage of that. Um, it's recommended that you store extra dry goods during a crisis to share with neighbors and families. Not only that, but you can use them as a bartering tool also. You know, someone may have some uh, medicine or something like that, and they're, they're missing some nice cheesecake, freeze-dried cheesecake that you have. <laughs> you might want to trade that off to them. Um, FEMA and SEMA recommends that you have three to seven days worth of food. Obviously, that's not a whole lot, three to seven days in uh, uh, a major catastrophe or a major emergency isn't really a whole lot of food to, to live off of. Um, it seems like that they want to go ahead and just give, you know, tell you to have that much until they get there and um, wander you off to someplace else. Um, if you read further on FEMA's website, though, they actually recommend three months of food for an act of God or disasters like uh, a F5 tornado, maybe even a hurricane, things of that nature. Um, during CERT, one of the instruct instructions that was told to the class is <coughs> FEMA recommends to SEMA and CERT team members have two to four years of provisions in a cataclysmic disaster that affects more than 51% of the nation. So that is a lot of food to store up. <coughs> two to four years worth. 
different types of storage, you got your, your long-term storage solutions. Um, the cheapest way to start this is just using simple five gallon buckets with sealable lids and mylar bags. The five gallon buckets generally store approximately 25 pounds of uh, certain foods such as rice, beans, oats, uh, things of that nature. Uh, reusable or resealable bags are another great way to start storing dry products. Uh, you can get a five pound bag of flour or sugar and you can store it in a Ziploc bag. You've tripled the recommendation of the shelf life of that product just by doing that. Mason jars and canning are an excellent way to store some dried products as well as fresh products. You can store beans, rice, etc. in mason jars with sealable lids <coughs> and they'll last an extremely long time sealed in those lids. Uh, regular Tupperware works wonders on storage of dry products as well. And um, you know, always remember if you're going to store your food, you want to store it in a cool and dry location in your home. So uh, a garage probably would not be a very good place to store your food. You'd want to store it somewhere like a basement or maybe a cabinet that's in a cool place in, in your house. A uh, basement would be ideal if you have one. Uh, I, I'm actually challenged on some of my storage locations because I don't have a basement. Uh, I just have a crawl space, so I can't necessarily store my food there. So I, you know, I'm challenged on some of my stored uh, food. Uh, some of your more advanced food storage is uh, freeze-dried or dehydrated food, uh, which there's a lot of the product over there on the freeze-dried or in dehydrated food. Uh, it's great because um, you know they have a shelf life of 10 to 25 years but they can also be a little bit expensive. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is, is I try to buy, whenever I buy freeze-dried food, I try to buy it when they have sales or they're trying to get rid of, you know, I don't buy it at the prime prices. I, I keep watch on that. Uh, it's more costly, but it is worth the investment because you get a lot of diversity. With fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains, you can get milk, butter, uh, a lot of different things, fish, chicken, meats, and uh, a lot of the meats are actual meats. Some of them, you know, it's not the, the fake TVP protein stuff that they uh, produce. Um, another option is uh, MREs. Um, that's great for long-term food storage, and they usually have a high calorie count. Um, generally, though, they only last for three to six years, depending on how they're stored. Um, I actually watched a video not long ago of a guy who stuck a MRE in his desk like 15 years ago and left it sitting there. It was sitting in his desk and they, him and his buddy pulled it out and ate it and you know sometimes they do last a little longer. They said it tasted pretty good so um, they didn't seem to get sick from it or anything. So. Um, a lot of it is 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 basically how it's how it's processed and how it's packaged. Uh, you know the downfall to these though that they're they're high protein, high calorie sources, and uh, you'll need some other source of, of fiber and vegetation and some of the uh, items that uh, Doc was talking about in your diet. You know you can't live on these indefinitely. You need some variety. You need some variety in, in your food stuff in your food supplies. Obviously, if you're sitting there and you're eating nothing but beans and rice for a whole entire month and your next meal is beans and rice, you're not going to be looking forward to that. Uh, it also isn't uh, very healthy for your body to be eating the same things over and over and over. Your, your body will, will stop processing some of the, uh, the protein and some of the calorie or the uh, uh, minerals and so forth that are in the food. Uh, gardening. It's probably the hardest of the storage methods. Uh, <coughs> learning the season and planting time frames or a skill set and practice, practice, practice. Uh, I have a garden and I'm practicing, practicing, and practicing. <laughs> I have found that there are some things that I can grow very, very well and some things that I just can't grow worth a darn. Um, I have no idea why there, there are certain things I've, I've always had a problem with uh, like broccoli and cauliflower just do not want to seem to grow for me at all um, and then I have other items such as uh, green beans and and 
uh, okra that just bloom and take off, and I have you know abundant sources of that. You know, um, so so and I do have some of the survival seeds and stuff too. So I'm learning what I can grow and what I can't grow. Corn's another one <coughs> for me. I have a hard time growing corn. Um, one of the reasons why I have a hard time growing corn is, is I can't keep the squirrels away from it. <laughs> they just don't want to stay away. There's another source of meat. <laughs> yeah, 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 squirrels, yeah. And, um, uh, but you know, if you do the gardening approach, definitely practice. Don't rely on this as your prime source of food for when something happens. Uh, obviously, unless you have a greenhouse or something, there are some foods that you can't grow during the winter. And there, believe it or not, there are some foods that you can grow during the winter, um, such as broccoli and some of those uh, hardier cabbage and things like that. Some of those thrive in some of the colder environments, believe it or not, for the area that we live in. Uh, obviously, with your uh, gardening, you can can. You can can uh, some of your vegetables. Um, basically, um, you can also can uh, meats, uh, soups, chilies, things of that nature, but some of that canning, you can't just do a boil can, canning method for that. You have to use a high pressure or a pressure cooker to be able to can those things. Uh, the reason why is, is because with a boiling method, you can't get the heat to you, the heat, you can't get it high enough to kill off uh, the bacteria and so forth that that lives on meat. You got to be able to achieve a much higher temperature, and the only way you can do that is using a pressure cooker. Um, uh, cooking without electricity, you know, many of your items in in your food stores, you'll need some type of fuel to cook or heat it up. Most of the freeze dried food, you need water. Uh, you just need water and be able to heat water up and and mix it in that way. Uh, some of the places that you can purchase some foods are uh, BePrepared.com. Uh, they have a lot of variety of freeze-dried foods. Uh, they have occasional sales specials. Uh, I'm on a mailing list for them, so whenever they do have specials and and so forth on some of their items, um, you know, I'll browse there and check it out. Uh, plus, they have catalogs. I even brought in a couple of catalogs over there from them. And uh, another place that uh, I have personally bought some of my food supplies is uh, CampingSurvival.com. Uh, they have a wide variety of selection, various different uh, items. They always have some very good deals on things. I get an email from them on a, a, a special Teotihuacan deal of the day. And if you're not familiar with Teotihuacan, it means the end of the world as we know it. Um, and so they send me an email every day on little special items, uh, little items that you might want to uh, put in your uh, prepping stores. And they always, like I said, they always have reasonable prices. And the question and answer comes later. So I'm sure that... Um, some of you will have some uh, questions on uh, a lot of the food stores later on. And like I said, there's plenty of...